do it. Um, the first talk is from uh, some participants that were at uh, Neuromatch Academy this, uh, this summer, and they are Rishika, Prakriti, and Vaiba. And they will give an interesting overview of uh, several methods to decode the activity from uh, neural spikes and more. So there are three of them and they will do the presentation together. So who starts? Hello, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So, hello guys. Uh, so should I start? Sure. Yeah. So uh, hello guys, this project was done as a part of Neuromatch Academy and was done by the four of us. However, one of us couldn't make it, make it due to some work commitments. His name is Narottam Singh and he is affiliated to the JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research in Mysuru. Yeah, so coming to the project, first we come to the question of why motor coordination is so interesting. The answer to this involves its enormously complex nature. Motor control and coordination is a fundamental characteristic of all animals, but it is still a field of active research. This is due to its intricate and complex nature, which involves directed coordination between a large number of muscles and consequently a large number of brain regions. Another reason why it's so complex is the fact that motor control is made possible by highly overlapping coordination and sometimes redundant coordination between multiple brain regions with some regions contributing more to the motor output than the other regions. So coming to the specific question we wanted to ask, the question is that can we predict the motor output by studying a number of neurons from different brain regions? And also, if the information represented by the different regions of the brain is equal or not. So uh, coming to where we obtained our information from, the data set we used for our analysis was the Steinmetz data set, which was published last year in Nature. The data set is from a uh, left-right decision-making task where the mouse had to execute a motor task by moving a wheel placed in front of it towards the left or right based on visual stimulus in front of it. The neural spikes were recorded from a large number of brain regions using multiple neuropixel electrodes. The trial consisted of two parts, one with correlation between the optic flow and wheel motion, and the other one with no such correlation. We focused on the open loop period where there was no correlation in order to avoid the stimulus related artifacts. I would now like to uh, call Rishika Mohanta to take over. Sorry, Rishika, you are muted. Hi, am I audible now? Okay, let's take a deeper look at the data set itself. We know that there are a large number of brain regions that are involved in motor control, including but not limited to the cortex, thalamus, basal ganglia, substantia nigra, and the cerebellum. The Steinmetz data sets hold a large number of recordings from multiple brain regions. First, we limited ourselves to regions with at least 50 simultaneous recorded neurons, and through a survey of literature, we identified regions that have been reported to be involved in motor control. Other than cerebellar recordings, we were able to identify multiple sub-regions and uh, from other important centers in the data set, although with different number of neural recordings and sessions and mice as shown as a figure on the right at the bottom. We also observed that there was a bias in the data set where a majority of the duration of the trials, there was no motor output at a stationary condition, but the number of left versus right outputs were balanced. Now, since there is no one best way to answer any scientific question, we chose to take a pluralistic multi-pronged approach. We hypothesized by taking two different pipelines, namely a spiking-based approach, which we call the population spike code, and a latent population coding approach, <clears throat> which we call latent information code, we would be able to regress to the same outcome. Both processes include a random sampling of neurons and trials from different brain regions in order to ensure the comparability of results once we have them. Now, the first approach that we took was a population spike code approach. 
The aim was to look at the individual spiking neuron activity of different neurons in a population, which we sample, and see if these, these spikes together can predict the motor output at the next time point. Now, this involved building a general linear model that learns the temporal kernels that convolve uh, the spiking activity and sum up together to give the motor output. This uh, 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 to give the motor at the end of the each window of activity. The first thing to note is that the length of these optimal window kernels is something that can vary from different region to region. And it's not something that we can assume to be uniform across all regions. So we had to first check if that was true. So what we did was sweep through different window sizes, different kernel sizes across different regions and use cross-validation to evaluate the uh, how good the prediction accuracy was and found what the optimal window size was for different brain regions. These results are summarized in the figure on the right to the top, where we find that different brain regions have different lengths of optimal history. And this is highly variable across sampling, but the, the means are slightly different across different brain regions. The other thing that we observed after we saw this was that spikes from different brain areas are only able to roughly predict the motor output, but to different degrees. Although the predictions are not perfectly accurate, as you can see from the R-square scores on the right uh, bottom, uh, we can say that there are differences in the ability of different brain regions to be able to predict the motor output. For example, if you look at the primary motor cortex and secondary motor cortex, MOP and MOS respectively, and you compare them to other regions like MD, medial, medial dorsal nucleus, you find that they have very different abilities. While one fails, the other does a much better job. The other thing that we could infer from this data set is what the nature of the information stored in the spiking itself was. How did we do this? So to, for this exact reason, we looked at and uh, performed analysis of the learned temporal kernel and uh, find that the amount of information encoded by the spikes is different across different, spain, uh, different brain regions. How we quantify this is by looking at the variation that is uh, the standard deviation is what we calculated and the distribution of the kernels of the sampled population and quantify the mean variation and the entropy across the duration of the entire temporal window. We found that regions such as the VPM consistently show higher diversity of kernels than many others in both the entropy and the kernel variation approach. The entropy we used was Shannon entropy. We also tried another parallel metric, which was the PCA participation fraction, for in which we looked at the number of principal components that were required to explain 90% of the variability in the temporal kernels. Now, I will leave it up to Prakriti Nayak to tell us about the latent information code approach, which is our second approach. For our second approach, uh, thank you, Rashika. Uh, we wanted to extract later dimensions from our population spiking data to build trajectories over time, uh, model as a Gaussian uh, process. So we implemented a pipeline to compute later dimensions of the spike data from around 50 randomly sampled neurons from around hundreds randomly sampled trials using GPFA, which is Gaussian process factor analysis, and LDA, linear discriminant uh, analysis, to classify directional output in the lower dimensional space. That directional output, as you can see, could be right, left, or stationary. Could you please change the slide? Yes. So uh, this figure shows the measurement for optimal dimensionality for GPFA for five randomly sampled regions, and it's fitted with sigmoid. You can see there's a lot of variability across regions, uh, while the GPFA fit saturates at different rates for different brain regions, but around 20 dimensions seem to be enough. So that is what we are going to be follow, following throughout the project from now on. Here, you can see that motor output uh, has been mapped on GPFA representation. Uh, we, can, we have segregated it to best representation and right, uh, worst of, you can see we have uh, pointed out the same regions, but those are different samples. So some regions separate motion better. So you can see it within the best ones, within the worst ones, they can separate motion better. But some at some places, the samples separate better than others. You can see on the top, 
the primary motor cortex and the bottom as well another sample of primary motor cortex but they they are showing vastly different separation so in order to account for the imbalance in the data uh, can you please change the slide yeah in order to account for the imbalance in the data we use balanced accuracy and weighted effort to see class classification is accurate and specific some regions have a much better accuracy for motor output than others from from the whole project, it was from Rishika's part. It was unconcluded that uh, uh, the spikes from different brain areas roughly predict the motor output to different degrees, uh, and encode different amount of information. These differences could be further explored by looking at patterns in temporal kernels across different regions, and through the latent information code part, we can we can infer that these regions do not separate the output equally. Uh, and using a larger sample and perhaps larger size, trial size could result in a better classification accuracy and help tackle the regional discrepancies in the results. Lastly, while our results represent movement output, we cannot, cannot infer explicit representation of the covariates that you generally see in motor papers, uh, such as the target position that you normally see in the Steinitz Stein stars and the endpoint and the mouse joint kinematics and the muscle activities, all those covariates that's normal uh, in a motor, uh, motor function paper. We can't see that because that's a function of um, single neuron recordings. And we are doing a population study here. So in that note, we can actually say that any much further exploration can be done with the data set. And as well as these pipelines, they, we can use this to answer more nuanced questions. Uh, these are our references. Uh, we would like to express our gratitude to entire Neuromash team, to Conrad, to Brad, to Dan, to uh, everyone else for making uh, sure that anime was a reality. Uh, a special thanks to Jason, who actually guided us through multiple steps that we went through, and we had five days to complete this project through our Neuromash Academy. And our TA Shagun, who taught us everything, basically. And these amazing cartoons, the colorful cartoons that you saw throughout the presentation, those were by Z Card. And we edited those a little bit. Uh, you can find his account in Instagram. Our code uh, is available on GitHub. And our poster on, you can find it here on, uh, find it here on Fixture. You can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. So we started from Neuromatch Academy, ended at Neuromatch Conference. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. It's a very interesting project, and it's very interesting that you managed to to do, to do this uh, out of Neuromatch Academy. At the near, you're now presenting it at the uh, Neuromatch Conference. So let's go for questions. Uh, I have a question. So for uh, the... Um, uh, different performances in uh, separating motor output based, based on the latent neural modes. Do you have uh, any interpretation aside the, the chance of maybe using a larger sample? Do you think that there may be another reason for these differences? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, now, if we were to look at the results that we see, there are uh, many different th uh, things that could be different uh, other than just sample sizes because uh, the variation in classification ability that we see might uh, be depending on the nature of the computation that is happening in these regions itself. Certain regions, might it might be possible to find lower dimensional representation, which is something we are assuming in our thing, right? We are assuming that we can break them down, the relevant information down to 20 latent dimensions. Now, whether the population activity itself is relevant or is it more dependent on single neuron activity is something that can definitely vary across different brain regions and might be the causative for the results that we see. Okay, that's very interesting. So uh, thanks again for the talk. Since it's uh, 15, let's try to keep the time and moving to the, the next talk. Of course, if anyone has other questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and uh, the panelists can uh, take on them. And uh, now our next speaker would be...